so you started, uh, um, I will once again facilitate and anyone want to uh, support this graph. All right. <laughs> Mary, <laughs> yay! <laughs> or Christina, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, yeah. Um, and before we go any further, I want to say um, uh, we have, uh, I, I can tell we, we have our newest and shyest Energy Commission member. He waited until he was no longer on the agenda to show it for me. <laughs> there you go. Tim Smith is uh, joining us from Smith Vocational. Um, and oh, how about if we, how about if we uh, go around the room and everybody introduce themselves? So I'm not sure if some of you know you know me, Energy Officer for the room. Uh, Bill White, City Council. Paul Spector, City Council. I'm Brian Bruce, I'm a citizen member. Dave Palmer, I'm Central Services Director. I'm Tim, you to be with Hi. Yeah. Scott Silver, citizen member. Christina Hodges, citizen. Who we have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. It's Chris Will, another copy of that. Yes. Oh, oh yes. Maybe you can find it. Yeah, you have only grabbed that. <laughs> Can I have it back? Uh, <laughs> just looks like a guy who lost it now. Yeah, he does. It's, 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 if you look very closely, I, I, I was filled with those. <laughs> Best way to I could not that. style if you want it. No. <laughs> I was seriously, it was just a big group. I was, uh, Drove for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, take this picture. Let's take this side here. You take the picture of the whole thing. <laughs> um, okay. I would um, uh, I would like to move that we approve the minutes of uh, the November 13th meeting. Open that up for discussion. Any, any discussion? Move to, move to accept. Then. Okay. Here we go. Second. Move to accept. Then. Second. All right. Any, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Same. No. Okay. Great. And then, um, right off the bat, um, I, I, I'm assuming you guys are bright energy. Uh, bright energy, yes. <coughs> okay, that's right. You, you have to put it all in one word. Sure. Okay, sure. Um, so, good afternoon. My name is uh, is Bill Morale. Chris Mason. I, uh, I'm Chris. Oh, you're Chris. Well, right. pleasure to meet you. Okay, yeah. um, well, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Welcome here. Thank you. Uh, and with me is, uh, is, is Craig Wire. So, um, fundamentally, we're here to talk about our, our energy curriculum uh, called uh, Brighter Classroom. And I wanted to give a quick snapshot of who Bright Energy is and, and how it plays into the curriculum as such and how it relates to the energy and sustainability. So, Bright Energy as an organization is a solar developer. Uh, we're based in Cambridge, Mass. Um, and we are talking with uh, many school systems as well as commercial businesses throughout uh, the Commonwealth. Um, regarding, you know, fundamentally sustainability initiatives, primarily solar and development. Um, that would include rooftop on a school system, uh, ground mount, which would, might, might be in a vacant field or landfill, uh, and or canopy in a parking lot. Um, and, you know, we've been in business for about five years now. We've done about 1,200 projects. Um, 80 of those have been in school districts. And what we wanted to do today was, was, number one, introduce our organization to you, but fundamentally talk to you about Brighter Classroom, which I think was of interest to you, Chris. Um, and then answer any questions uh, that you might have regarding our organization or the curriculum as we talk to the, the school system, potentially the town, and or other businesses, commercial businesses, that might have interest in solar, um, and then tie that back into investor-owned utility, whether that be National Grid or NSTAR or municipal territory and, and, and nuances of such. So. Um, with that, any questions on, on my on my side as it relates to the company or corporate structure? So I, do, I do want to just mention that um, I, I've spoken to our facilities folks with the schools, yep. and uh, they've kind of contacted someone in the schools. No one's, no one's here directly from them, but I'm paying attention for uh, probably bring some information back to the teachers. And then Tim Smith works at our uh, Low Tech Ag School. Okay. Um, this okay. This person, so. Uh, although they already have this over already. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, again, and, and like I said, we're, 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 we're talking with a lot of folks about our organization and what the curriculum needs to the educators particularly, and then, um, you know, the benefits of sustainability with solar. And incidentally, Craig and I are out to meet. We're, in, uh, we're moving along in due diligence with Mount Holyoke College right now, particularly uh, in, in this market. Craig can talk with a few of those. So with that, I'm going to hand the forward to Mr. Dwyer, and uh, he can uh, talk a little bit and then answer questions. 
Thanks a lot, Phil. <coughs> yep, pass this one to you first. Chris. Take a look and pass that around the room. So guys, I'm Craig Blyer, um, Director of Sales up here in the Northeast. Been working in Massachusetts Energy for the past six years now, um, and I've worked in both private utility territories, your national grids, your and stars, and also served a good term with uh, the Ready Municipal Light Department, been working with some of their largest customers up there. Um, things have changed a lot with solar since 2000, 2009. So and when most people hear solar energy, if anybody's tried to put a solar array on their house or on their business prior to 2009, you probably saw a, a payback that was, you know, 30 plus years, 25 plus years. And, you know, make with rational decision making and, you know, short funds, that's a, it's a tough decision to make to really put your money into something sustainable for something that has a 25 uh, year payback. And so in, in 2009, something big changed and a large piece of that was based on the tax credit that's available for these systems. And we'll talk about how that affects the schools in a minute here, but that tax credit used to have a cap on it. It's a 30% federal tax credit on the total purchase of a solar system. But up until 2009, this was capped at $2,000. So back in 2009, you know, a small residential system might have cost $100,000. So that 30% federal tax credit, it was always 30% or $2,000, the lesser of. So, you know, your payback was still going to be 25 or 30 years on a residential system. Well, in 2009, they did something really interested, interesting and lifted the cap on that federal tax credit. So now that opened up the playing field so we could literally, you know, purchase $100 million worth of solar and get a $30 million federal tax credit. So that's why, you know, since 2009, I mean, now if you get in an accident on the road, there's like a one out of three chance it might be a solar truck, right? <laughs> Everybody's seen a lot of solar developers up here in Mass. So that's, that's one big reason why you've seen kind of solar developers take to the Commonwealth and a lot of solar development popping up. The other reason is because Massachusetts, we've set some aggressive state goals. The state of Mass wants 1.6 gigawatts of solar energy in the state. Um, and that's a ramp up from their 400 megawatt goal, which was from their, the first wave of their program. But what that means is that not only has Massachusetts set a goal for how much solar energy they want in the state, but they've also put a penalty for the utilities for not having the correct amount of solar energy in their portfolio. Ultimately, what that all means to energy consumers is that the levelized cost of solar energy has gotten very competitive. And for the schools, what's come about is a structure called the Power Purchase Agreement and leasing options. And so, you know, the biggest part we talked about was kind of 30% of that total system cost turning into uh, uh, being a tax credit. But schools don't, yeah, at least public schools, don't have any tax liabilities. So that doesn't really make sense in terms of an investment for them. And two, you know, owning and operating energy assets isn't necessarily uh, the educational model, so to speak. Well, and that's where Brightergy comes in. Um, you know, we have really pioneered this brighter classroom curriculum where we're not only helping schools <coughs> save on energy costs with zero capital out of pocket, but we're taking it a step further with this K through 12 common core standards curriculum. And this, teachers receive this in the same way that they would receive their math or science curricula today. And I see this as the, I see this as the computer class of the 90s, I like to say. If somebody told me back in fifth grade when I was in typing class, you know, before text messaging and everything happened and we just learned automatically. I would have told them they were crazy if, you know, 20 years later we were all going to be on computers and have our tablets out on the desk in front of us all the time. Well, you know, it's the same thing with energy right now. Uh, if you had told, I was pre-med back in college, if you had told me I was going to be, you know, working, doing business development in renewable energy sales, I would have told you you were crazy. But, you know, myself, a lot of my friends, we, we work in energy, whether it's project finance, auditing, install side. There are lots of different jobs up here, especially popping up in the Commonwealth. We're the number one energy efficient state in the country. So the brighter, bright classroom really seeks to educate kids, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school, and get them understanding the basics of energy, energy efficiency. Um, there's a lot of crossover in there, um, the higher levels with 
physics, um, but some very valuable lessons that teachers can incorporate into the classroom. And brighter G, I still mentioned a little bit about the structure. We're almost 100 people now. Uh, most of those are project management, engineering, the few, the proud, on the sales and uh, you know advocacy end. But uh, we actually went last year and hired internal program managers at Brighter G. And these are several people that came from academia, you know, elementary, middle, and high school, to go and actually work the brighter classroom into curriculums. And it's funny, you know, I talked with Allie Reynolds, our program, our head program manager, and she came from teaching second grade. And I mean, I came in, I'm like, this is fantastic. We've got an energy curriculum to offer with all of our zero capital outlay solar projects. And she says, Craig, listen, if, if you had told me back when I was teaching second grade that I had to work one more thing into the curriculum and like into the short time I have that's already filled, I would have lapped you out of the door and told you you were crazy. So that changed my perspective a little bit. But we have internal program managers that actually fly out to all of our project sites and educate the stakeholders, work with the staff so that the science personnel and science staff can work this into the curriculum in a streamlined fashion and make sure it's not something that just sits on the shelf. But um, you know, the, the, I think the opportunity for solar and efficiency and sustainability in Massachusetts is the best in the country and I think that the Brighter Classroom curriculum is a fantastic start to getting energy into you know, the topic, into the classroom. So, any questions you guys uh, might have for me? What, what grade level is the curriculum being for? The curriculum is K through 12 right now. Um, it's being expanded upon as we speak, um, but right now it is for K through 12. And do you have any schools that are using it? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've actually, we've worked with 80 different school districts and we've uh, done projects, whether LED or solar um, or micro turbines, at over 400 school sites. Um, so could you send me some contacts? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And, you have um, to. Uh, if there's, um, if you're not the one installing the solar, would you also help teachers use this curriculum for someone else's solar install or a currently installed solar array? Uh, we would, uh, we would, yeah, although, <laughs> you know, it, that's not really at the core of our business model. You know, at uh, the core of our business model, we, a lot of our business is done via project-based revenue, but, you know, we like to put our money where our mouth is and, you know, show that we are more than just a, uh, a development and construction company, right? I would, I would say along those lines, right, Chris, I mean, the brighter classroom component is something that we think separates us from another developer, right? Okay. So we've, we've invested a lot of human capital in developing it, um, and that's, that's, you know, when they go out to bid an RFQ, you know, that's one of the line items that they can't fulfill. Um, okay. So just to clarify, when we partner with a school system that is packaged, there is no cost outlay uh, to, to the school system, you know, provided we're selected as the partner of choice for the solar more efficiency program. Okay. So. And this girl intro, I don't know what you do, but um, you said you did LED installs for some schools. I'm wondering if you're on board with the Mass Utilities to be their approved providers for their rebating design programs for lighting we, and efficiency primarily. We are. we are for this year. Um, however, lighting right now is, is kind of finicky when it comes to the uh, rebates for the tube lights. And so much of our schools we found are made up of the tube lighting. And so, you know, if you give this, for example, this is <coughs> probably has three volts per fixture, right, per uh, square fixture. So you only get the incentive on a per <coughs> fixture basis and not a per lamp basis for the tubes. Mm -hmm. However, the canned lighting and a lot of the outdoor lighting that has more run hours, those you can make financial sense of. But uh, with the limited run hours and a lot of the tube lighting, it's, uh, it's difficult to make, to get the return on investment you'd expect at this time. They have pretty good direct install programs, though, where they'll actually come and replace your lighting. We've done that in the city with our, with the city on buildings, and there's commercial programs. And yep, they do. If you work, uh, if you work direct through National Grid and uh, obtain the rebates through National Grid or NSTAR, they they come in waves. But if you check their website regularly, um, yeah, you'll find us on the approved installer Great. list. And so uh, to, to answer your question directly, we are an approved provider, right, on the list for Massachusetts. And that said, though, one of the things that we have found, particularly in school systems, not necessarily commercial business, what we call runtime, 
which is you know you have you have a gap in the summer and then you have you don't have a you have a, a limited number of hours versus a commercial business that might run two shifts and have a lot of capital equipment running. Um, so because it's prescriptive, um, the the financial incentive sometimes doesn't have the right payback for for a school system per se and and, and a lease where there's no capital outlay. Uh, however, we are looking at. Um, there are some components in the legislation that if automation is a, com is a component of the fixture retrofit, mm -hmm. um, then the rebate is more significant. And we're in due diligence now and should be at the end of the first quarter to determine um, what level of quote unquote light automation we might be able to provide to a school system that would qualify for the rebate, put it into a larger bucket, and then make more financial sense. And usually we do a, a, a 10 year lease and we have to show about a three year payback on the front end so it starts to make business sense for the school system. Um, but we could talk more about that longer, you know, if we've got to do diligence with the system and how it would apply particularly to, to the town. I'm not clear on uh, when you offer bright, brighter classrooms as part of one of your project value adds. Are you offering a curriculum, a person, a train the trainer? All three. Yeah. Now you want to talk more about that, correct? Right? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, basically, we would have our our internal program team. You know, flies out to the installation. Uh, they're based in our Kansas City headquarters, so uh, they actually fly out to the installation, coach the teachers, so that they they can weave this into the science curriculum as they see it now. Um, you know, without sacrificing other lessons. But it, that way, it's, it's more than just sort of a binder handoff. Yeah. You know, there's actually support there, and that's their, their full-time support to make sure that these teachers know how to how to really take that in the classroom. Um, so that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, so let me add a little bit to that. So we have an application. It's called Brighter Link. Everything's brighter at Brighter G. Uh, we could have used a little warmer today. But um, we have an application called Brighter Link, and there are modules within the application. And the two would, would, would apply, or possibly three would apply. One is Classroom, which is the electronic version of, of the document that you're looking at today. Um, and the other component is actually visibility into the usage and the energy generation of a system in a school system. So that data can then be extrapolated electronically and used in conjunction with the curriculum. Um, to teach the students through K through 12. Uh, so there's the empirical data that the system actually generates in terms of usage, demand, peak capacity, and things of that nature. Um, that ties back into the software app that the school system get a gets access to. Yeah. Um, how how do you yes. that <laughs> is your corporate logo in this process? The, uh, I understand that the curriculum is designed to um, generate a fluency in, in energy and energy concepts and going forward, and I think that's laudable. But the question is, if, you're, if your corporate logo is embedded throughout the whole process, of course, there's the mild influence of, of uh, persuading a particularly malleable group towards uh, favoring one corporation in the future. Is that uh, So the question is, how much are your fingerprints all over this thing, essentially? PDF form, but I yeah, think it's a PD, there are PDFs. I mean, I think yeah. we have the word file saved somewhere. Um, <laughs> uh, we haven't had somebody, uh, we haven't had somebody ask yet to remove our logo and sort of, uh, you know, rebrand it for a school district. Or um, I mean, if you think it's the same way with McGraw Hill, right, or uh, any of the textbook manufacturers. Of course, McGraw Hill is not a developer, but the, but the fact is that I'm just that's all I was curious about is yeah. how how prevalent is your logo and. and Visibility of, of the other concern of mine is, is of course corporate influence on particular on, on a curriculum line mm -hmm. um, because point in fact actually we, we try to at least our ethos is to try to divorce ourselves from that. Right. That's not to say that you guys are disingenuous or that or anything of the sort. In fact, I think this is laudable. I like the idea because I do think we need to concentrate on this. My concern is of course. Mm -hmm is trying to maintain that separation without being, you know, without creating a, a, a subliminal influence. Sure. Um, I would say, first time we've been asked the question. Um, well, so, so well, I, 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 yeah, he's from your curveball. First time we've been asked the question. And welcome to Northampton. <laughs> <laughs> been here before. Uh, uh, but, uh, I don't know if it was maybe one of the, one of the, uh, one of the little local pubs down the street.
street um, a long time ago. But um, no, good question. We, we haven't been asked before, right? And, and if that was a, a concern, I mean, again, we want to show flexibility in our partnership in terms of, of you know, um, making it more white label, right? I guess we could talk about that. Um, the other side of it is, though, is, is, is we created the intellectual capital, right? So, so we want credit for that. Um, but at the same point, I do see your, your, the component of, you know, the influence and, and, and how that applies, particularly in the classroom environment, right? Um, so I guess we could take that under advisement, and, and if we were to get farther down the path with you, certainly look to show flexibility as a component of that. Um, if it was a, a showstopper, or you needed us to water it down, per se. It's a, yeah, and, and I would leave it <coughs> to uh, the people who actually set up the pedagogy is, uh, to vet it. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I'm just more curious. I really don't. It, it, you shouldn't be concerned, because I really don't have much of a say in the whole thing. Yeah, no, but I think it's, you know, <laughs> that's, I guess... That's what this forum is for, right? Is to, is to uh, ask the tough questions, and, and hopefully we can we can answer them. Okay. Chris. Oh, oh, oh sorry, Chris. I, I, I should be over there. <laughs> but just a comment about the about the branding, just so you know, as far as educational uh, uses of corporate logos, I run a conference that's a full educational conference. The Institute of Architects, the USGBC, the Building Performance Institute, they all require that corporate logos are removed from PowerPoints during the educational sessions. It's 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 to focus on the education sure. as opposed to focus on the Yeah. So I mean, I would think it, there's precedent. Yeah, if that if that's SOP, then if that's standard, then then that's it's not an issue for us, right? Um, and we know that Generally speaking, the board, the school committee, the town is the one who makes the business decision around the betting of the partner, um, and the fact that you know you're required to go out to RFP and RFQ, and that that the partner that you've selected um, has been done the proper due diligence on. So you know, with that in mind, you know the decision is made. We're the partner. We could we could pull it out again. That's I, I don't foresee it a big issue. And like I said, no one has asked us before. So. Yeah, that's true. Um, I have a, an observation and a question. Uh, the observation is, is that because of Bill's comments, and I think there's probably other people that feel the same sort of way, but my thought was is you ought to separate your businesses. You should have two distinct uh, uh, profit centers. You should have the, the installation, so forth, and the educational, because I don't know the business of education, but looking through the book and listening to you, and knowing what we're doing in this city, I really think the educational part of it has a, has a really strong demand. And, um, you know, it might even be a suggestion that we take a look at buying it, you know, as a, as you say, capsules, all kinds of different things. And I, I really applaud you for putting together something like that. The question I have, though, is to Tim more, because, and I don't know if he can answer this or not, but are there, are there programs like this that are available to the schools to teach? Environmental, uh, you know, I think that individual uh, curriculum that made up by the teachers. I don't think the package like this is. Brian, I can't say there are other packages out there. Right. Uh, National, uh, National Energy Education Development is one of the big ones, mm -hmm. uh, federal funded uh, one. Um, but um, uh, so there are other packages. Uh, out there. Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you should sit on our strategic planning committee um, <laughs> because along those lines, that is a consideration of ours. So as as we build out the program and it becomes uh, you know more robust in the, the what we where we're seeing in the overall market marketplace, not only the educational market but the commercial market, is there is an appetite for that in a software format. You bet. Um, and then, you know, it, it creates, there's the business model around that, right? Which is, you know, we're a project-based developer with mm -hmm. engineering and project managers and, and developing the financial components of a transaction. Right. And then there's being a software company, right? And which hat do we want to wear? Although, um, I actually have a very deep software background and that's one of the things that we're in due diligence on, so. Mm -hmm. um, well, but we'd like to do a project with you and give it to you for free before we have to charge you for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing you can, if you have it set up as two separate private centers, you have pricing uh, for the for the educational part of it right. could be subsidized by the addition of business that the school or school district might be interested in giving you. But at the same time, you're not giving it away, giving away to something that I think is pretty valuable for free. So. Well, as Scott noted, though, I imagine the inception of this project was a, a value added. 
a very uh, a unique and distinguishing feature that you offer as developers <coughs> so that other developers don't offer. So I imagine that's it's the original incentive. Yeah. It doesn't discount the value of the work that you put into it, but it, it has to be viewed on our part as that is, is, is entree. And uh, so that, you know, that would probably figure in the calculus as we try to um, determine whether this is appropriate for us. Yeah, you're exactly right. So one of our founders is extremely involved in, in philanthropy and the entrepreneurial aspect of, of teaching and, and the science around teaching and teaching of the science and both vice versa. And that was why it was developed, which was it was a, an opportunity for one, um, for him to, to put his, his, his thought process into place. And then the second, it became an opportunity, frankly, to, to flank the competition, right. um, being that's a competitive marketplace. Right. Any other questions? Guys, thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. As we move forward with uh, looking at PV and different locations, we'll keep this in mind. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate Fantastic. the time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your next Yeah, thank you. Um, I just noticed sure. I actually jumped over an agenda item. Uh, we do normally have a public comment period, and we normally don't exercise it because we generally don't have the public. Thank you very much. But I, we do have a public face. So does anybody out there need to uh, have a moment to say something? Oh, okay. Very good. Um, okay, Mary, you want to come on up and join us again? I, there's the, oh, we're full up. I have such oh, a nice view goodness. of the Smiling Commission. <laughs> <laughs> so, Happy New Year. Well, you, you okay. Public comment's over, though, so you can't <laughs> talk <laughs> anymore. And it would help, it would help the, the gender and equity balance. You know? <laughs> yeah, it would. Yeah, exactly. It does look like a bunch of... Okay, I'll swap with you. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is perfect. I can um, almost see that. <laughs> okay, but it actually does bring up the next uh, agenda item real quickly. Um, you know, so Mary, actually your term did expire in November. Oh, okay. I wish I'd noticed that earlier. Uh, <laughs> so you're where you belong. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even and show yet, up And yet yet. this has happened in the past and uh, people have just kept on going. So. <laughs> um, uh, I invite you to reapply. I guess okay, they have great. a new application. Um, I have a copy it, of is that here. is that okay? Do they? Yes. Okay. Yes. In fact, I personally, I for one would prefer that. Okay. <laughs> I, I hope you do reapply. Great. Yeah. Right. Okay. I actually talked to the mayor's office, and they're um, uh, they'd love to have you reapply. Super. So, yeah. Okay. We'll do. And then just a, a heads up, um, uh, Brian, you're the next one. Uh, yeah. I'll be in March. Okay. So just a kind of picture. So yeah. I should get my application ready, or? Yeah, March. March. You're ready. <laughs> <laughs> we should start now because they put the application down to 40 pages. Got a notebook the guy was carrying. That would be kind of by March. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right. So the next agenda item: community energy efficiency outreach planning. Uh, as you recall, as you may have recalled, um, with the an offshoot from the strategic energy planning that we did with Mass Clean Energy Center last summer, they gave us the opportunity to apply for uh, some implementation funds, and we applied to do a study of photovoltaic arrays on top of our parking lots, and to look really strongly at our demographics. Um, so we can uh, uh, identify just how, what is the best approach to try to engage our residents and citizens and businesses in energy efficiency. Um, because it really depends a lot on what building you live in, what the age the house is in, what kind of style it was built, whether you have moisture problems, whether you have knob and tube issues, uh, what's your income, who do you connect with, who do you, you know, communicate with. All influences your all influence your decision, and energy efficiency has got a a really strong track record of being very difficult to market. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, to put it in perspective, if a product reaches 15% market share, they probably made it. You know, they they if if, if it's 50% uh, of everybody is buying their product, that's huge success for most people. For an energy efficiency, we need 100%. Um, you know, so we have this. We have a much higher hurdle to, to jump over than most products that are trying to be marketed. And it's a really amorphous, hard to imagine um, product. So the idea is, instead of just trying to throw another pro program in, that we did, we tried to uh, do a program in the Ryan Road neighborhood a number of years ago when uh, Claire Higgins was still uh, the mayor. And it totally flopped because there were some issues with the uh, buildings that just made it, made it problematic. 
So instead of just throwing another one out there, the idea was to really dive down and do some studying before we put together a program uh, so we know what we're doing here in North Africa. And let's give ourselves a better shot at it. And, um, and so that's what we applied for for funds from the Max Community Center. They've been hanging us out there on the end of the sticks since uh, mid-June last year, and the grant has finally come through. So uh, we've met once, Aiden, you were, uh, you know, Aiden, Mary, Brian, you guys were all on the, on the committee. The, the money is now here. We've been given permission to actually move forward. Um, so uh, with that, and you might actually, I think you had something else you wanted to bring up on this topic. Um, no, I thought energy I ran to Chris at the co-op yesterday and told him that I've been thinking about this exact thing around uh, particularly how people are engaged online around energy efficiency. There's some new tools in the home improvement market that are kind of taking off, linking builders and designers with the you know, people in the $300 billion home improvement industry. And it's kind of this um, open field where there's very little uh, marketing and successful kind of engagement happening around building construction online. So um, I'm curious, like, how can people be engaged online and, and break down the, the uh, trust barrier between professionals and homeowners? Or, you know, there's this kind of thinking that people get some information and they can't trust it or they just talk to their neighbor. But what about the, w the wealth of resources that the internet can be, whether it's you know, through um, some kind of social media platform where there's reviews and descriptions of projects with photos and there's a whole educational context to this too. Where right now a lot of education on energy efficiency online is like DOE government, six pages of words that no one wants to read. And it's like how do we bring this down just to, to what people understand? What can they read in line in the coffee shop about what their neighbor's doing, what's in their attic, what do they have to improve it? and kind of create a viral buzz around it. So it's something I'm thinking of in the context of maybe this is something I want to get into. And um, so I've been thinking I need to start by surveying homeowners and also uh, contractors and professionals. You know, how can they use the internet better to get the word out, to share what they're doing, not typical marketing, but really to, to show projects. And um, they kind of have, so I have a lot more ideas and, uh, surveys and questions and how to use people. I think it would, it would be a really good um, thing to dovetail in this process. Um, so I guess I'm just saying, like, I, I'm thinking about this and I'd love to, to help start that um, survey process. One might be willing to help you on that, but I also wonder, are there places where this has been successful? Are there any communities that have had, have had some way of reaching out and, and so we don't have to start from scratch? There might be some kind of even advertising tricks to this that are that have been used in other places. And I welcome others to answer that as well. you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I know one successful marketing strategy that a company in Boston has done. They've grown very fast. Next Step Living, they're actually out here now, Western Mass. But they're on Inc.'s like, top 500 growing companies of 2014. And, um, so they basically started as a, doing community marketing. So they would partner with businesses and organizations and towns, um, kind of saying, you know, Let's offer as a benefit to your employees our energy efficiency services, the free energy audit from the utilities which they provide. And you know, will you offer as a benefit a matching, you know, three hundred dollars towards an installation project? That's kind of the basic structure of their outreach program, and it worked really well. It was very unique, and they kind of, you know, they got into tabling at green events or at lunch for uh, lunch and learn games. So that's one approach that worked. Um, but it was very much, you know, it was a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, it's like, the interest now of doing that are companies wanting to sell their services, so these folks who saw it, you know? So it's, it's um, in terms of just education, um, I don't know of anything that's <coughs> really been successful. You know, yeah. the, the utilities do a lot of that. You know, they, they had tons of money in marketing and outreach, um, but frankly, they're bad at it, and they don't use the internet and their website's a mess and confusing, and, and meanwhile, they're the experts, but they also have their interests. And I've said this over and over, when you get your free energy audit through the utility company, it's the utility company's interests are presented in your house. It's not necessarily what's good for your house or for you. Um, whether it's they don't even consider half the materials that might be viable, or they only go to code minimum instead of better when you're doing a project, you might as well do it right. So there's, 
there's all there's a need for kind of breaking down that the existing structure and being disruptive as you will to, to the existing outreach and right. So so um, this is something that so I work for the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association. This is one of the things that a lot of our members have an interest in. They are very interested in promoting efficiency before adding PV to your roof, for example. This is a big building, you know, not to crack. And uh, on the residential front, we found that we used to have this program that we don't run anymore that was very successful here in Northampton for a couple of the years called Green Buildings Open House. Mm -hmm. And when you go to somebody's house and you talk to the homeowner, it, it, it's, that, that makes the difference. So if they show you, um, you know, hey, I've got these great windows. I love them. I can sit right next to them when it's zero degrees. Uh, and I'm speaking for myself, you know. I can sit next to my windows when it's zero degrees because they're triple pane windows and they're great. Um, that makes a big difference. <coughs> it's hard to show people the insulation, but I can, you know, you can show people a, a you know, an attic hatch that's, you know, 20 inches deep, that kind of thing. But I think it's a seeing is believing thing in some, in some measure. And right. it's, it's hard to show efficiency a lot of ways. I, I also think it's actually pretty there's a there's a parochial aspect to this. I mean, people who uh, usually, I, I'm assuming, go and pursue energy retrofits are already invested in that and have some sense of it. There's a shibboleth involved. There's a kind of special language that's associated with mm -hmm. it, as you described, the, the DOE's document. But the same thing as our conversations here that will put people in comas if you go. And, and it also, it's, it, 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 it's fairly complicated. I mean, it's not a simple matter of you could buy this gadget and boom, your energy costs are reduced and your house is warm. Or here's your light bulb. And here's your light bulb and that's all it takes. Yeah. Bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> and that's the frustrating thing because, first of all, not only, it just it's daunting just to even start to wade in that water, I think. And then once, you, once you're up to ankle deep, then it starts to become really, then you're, there's so many variables, and there's so many, uh, as, as you both have pointed out, the, the, the variety in ho housing stock and structures, and suddenly, so there's not a one-size-fits-all type of KTEL kind of solution to someone's world, which makes it exponentially harder. And plus, as Chris points out, that the bar is so much higher because we have to get so much buy-in uh, in order for it to work, that it's, it, and I think that, honestly, I mean, this sounds somewhat cynical, but I think that the way you might have to promote this is with a KTEL kind of promotion mindset. Like early adopter, focus on early it. adopter, but just do a, a kind of a gee whiz kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's I mean everyone's looking for a miracle cure. This is not a miracle mm -hmm. cure. This is actually thoughtful and makes sense. But if you sell it as a miracle cure, if you talk about the, I mean, today you'd be able to sell it without a problem. When we start pitching it in June, it's not so much of a big issue. But on a day like today, you're saying you're freezing your ass off. Here's an opportunity. The, the other challenge is we have reduced oil costs now all of a sudden. So everyone's starting to feel like, well, all right, it's not, I, I've saved $1,000 from last year, and I didn't have to do anything. I just sat by and waited for the world to move around me. So it's, it's, those are the challenges because I think the people who we are getting are people who are receptive to it anyway. We're actually already pursuing this kind of line. Uh, it's the people that are just saying, that's just too much to think of. I don't want to work on my house. If I do anything to my house, I'm going to put a deck on it. I'm not going to, uh, you know, I don't, what's a PV? What the hell is that? Uh, um, in, and those are the people that you need to connect with and, and make the case. And, uh, and you have the case to make that they're, a significant savings that they get a return and plus their house is warm. Um, so you find out what stresses them about home, or home ownership and see if you have the solutions to offer them for those stresses and present it clearly without the shibboleth, without the secret language, but in plain, very simple, accessible terms and concepts. Easier said than done. And then how do you do it? I mean, do you, and I think online is our best option at this mm -hmm. point. Once upon a time, it would be through television and advertising, but I think online is the best way. But that, how do you, with commercials, you throw that in their face on television. You have to see a commercial. But with an internet, you got to get them to come to it. And that's, there is the challenge. Mm 
Yeah, I, I actually see a, a mid place where, uh, you know, and that's actually one of the reasons to look at better graphics is you mentioned a few people that are more likely to move forward. There's, there's people who are ready to do a deep energy retrofit. And then there's others that, you know, are only going to put in some right. light bulbs. Um, but if you can better identify the different markets in Northampton and then micro targets, you know, your approach for that target. If you're only, only going to put in light bulbs, well, then we want micro, you know, micro target light bulbs to them. But for the folks who are just about ready to go on to a deep energy retrofit, if we can identify that here, how do we reach them? I don't think it's necessarily only the internet. I think it's going to be communities, uh, yeah. neighborhood associations. Um, you know, how do they communicate with each other? How do they, businesses, you know, through like Next Step Living, through a business and then down through their employees. So, uh, so that's the kind of things that I'm looking at, at doing. Um, I do want to say on top of that, Next Step Living, um, uh, they're probably the one organization I know of that has enough information from outreach that they actually now can start to fine tune what works. Most people don't know how to do it. They've done it enough. The only problem is when they do it, they do the minimum energy efficiency that the utilities want, and then they try to sell you new windows or a PV array. And that again is not exactly what everybody needs. You know, they, they, they're, they're trying to use it as a way to leverage a bigger ticket item that they sell. Um, so they don't, These guys. yeah, they, so they haven't quite you know, hit what I think is needed, but they do they have probably have the best track record out there so far as getting, getting you know, as a company that's actually managed to get something out of it. So there are some places we can learn from, but you know, no one's really done this yet uh, completely. So this is our, I'd be happy our chance yeah, to attempt yeah, it. Yeah, let's, let's talk. Just a couple of questions. It seems like you have lessons from the solar rides in Northampton yes. in terms mm -hmm. of that. Isn't that, can I yeah. guess related, I really like what you said about trying to figure out what those community networks are to get the word out. Because the one thing that made me nervous when we first started talking about the demographic analysis is those early adopters tend to be upper middle class yeah. professionals. I want to make sure we're, I mean, yeah, let's get those as well, but also make sure we're getting everybody. Right. And that's the idea of breaking it down. Because if you just go out with something, you're going to have a certain part of the population that just simply doesn't <coughs> um, If it doesn't fit them. So, the thing is to identify how the population breaks down, identify what the barriers are for each different piece of the population, then to find the tools to get over those barriers so that we can actually help them. You know, help if they're low income, well then how do we reduce the cost more? Uh, you know, if it's time and effort, how do we give them more assistance, um, et cetera. Right. So Kristen, just to bring us back yeah. around to the CDC. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Time frames, calendars on their part, the award itself, uh, expected products. I mean, where, where are we with that at this point? I mean, as okay. far as what track may be going down and try to leave in what we were just talking about? Right, okay, so the Clean Energy Center. Um, uh, well, the grant is just, we haven't even signed the contracts right. yet, but the grant contract is now, uh, for the grant is now out there. Uh, so we have, we've had one working group meeting on this, a number of, <laughs> where we thought we were about to get the grant, then it just never showed up. So uh, the action item I would have for tonight is, uh, again, to ask who's interested in being on a working group. And I think we need to set aside another time for the working group to get together and start mapping out just who, you know, what is the organization? Because the Mass CEC had one stipulation on this. You have to use this money to hire a consultant, basically. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, I mean, it's kind of a strange thing, but that's what they basically said. You have to hire someone. So, uh, who can help us with the demographics? I mean, do we hire Next Step Living to kind of pull something through, or do we? Yeah, probably not. But, uh, uh, but so I want to have a meeting to start kind of batting that around. What do we want to get out of this? Where do we? You know, what is the end product that we really do want? Let's fine tune that, and then try to identify who we who we go out for, and and eventually we'll get an RFP uh, put together, um, in the hopes that you know timeline wise, it'd be wonderful to have. Uh, some demographic information pulled together, some surveys done um, by next fall, so that as we're diving into the next winter season, we are ready to start identifying what kind of, you know, what's the next step? How do we actually try to implement something for this? What is the so grant? Time. How much is the grant for? Uh, Fifteen thousand. Okay, and that's for assessment or for implementation of the program, or that would be uh, helping us pull together this information, basically preparing us to put together a, a, a program. So it wouldn't be implementing a program, it would be um, uh, 
pulling together the demographics, doing some surveys. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe some focus groups, uh, possibly. Um, you know, uh, and just really try to identify who our market is. Do um, you consider approaching Smith School of Engineering or um, uh, UMass or something like that? For I'm glad you mentioned that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because I got a call just yesterday um, from the UMass Extension Program in Buildings and Energy. And um, I am not convinced that this is exactly what they're looking for, but they really do want to partner with uh, communities. And I think they're aiming more for, um, you, you know, what's the, uh, the physics and the, and the study needed, how a building works. So the building science uh, side of it um, is possibly more what they're for. But they also very well may be on the outreach and, uh, and, uh, and marketing communication around it. So I've got a call into them. Um, so UMass Extension Program and Building and Energy, we got a big pot of money. Um, and yes, that might be able to get us some, uh, some you know, professors uh, helping with uh, statistics analysis or whatever. Has to mention GIS too, the whole mapping component of it. There you go. Right. Yeah. So, so yes, that's one. That's one possibility. UMass. Yeah. So does all the fifteen thousand have to go to a consultant? That's what the or just some of it and hire a couple of grad students to assist with. Oh, I think it, I think you know grad students if they're helping a consultant kind of pull the information together or something. I think that would probably be okay. Um, if if we have any questions, I would call Mass EDC and just have a conversation. Uh, so with that, um, uh, I have just saw a number of people nodding their heads. Um, I know Brian, you were involved in the past. Paul, mm -hmm. I see. Okay, you'd like to be in there. Anybody else? Mary, just a mm -hmm. And when can we pull together a? What's a good time for a work um, group meeting? <coughs> Which would be listed as a standard energy commission meeting. Um, just so, so that no so one. So would be open to the public. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Just because. You know, open meeting law, mm -hmm. it, it's easier just to keep it open. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, yes, yeah, I just wanted to know if I could, I wasn't planning on saying anything, but uh, since you're talking about this particular topic and I'm just starting to get involved with this sort of work, um, I thought it might just spend a few minutes saying something. Sure. Okay. okay. We'll call that. a public comment. Yeah. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll shift back to the public comment. Okay. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Dante Davies. I, uh, I just joined an organization called Co-op Power uh, as a full-time community organizer about a month ago. Um, I wasn't planning on saying anything today. I just wanted to come and just find out what, uh, I'm a resident of Northampton too, by the way, uh, what Northampton was doing around energy efficiency and sustainability. Um, and now that you guys happen to bring this particular topic, um, I happen to have a document here called uh, Energy Efficiency Canvassing. <laughs> You know how to get started. I uh, should have mentioned co-op power. Co-op power does have their own track record. Nice. Yep, nice. yep with, with a very narrow group of people, but it's definitely um, effort that's been done. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. we're, we're a uh, community-owned or a member-owned uh, sustainable energy cooperative. We're just focused on building out democratically controlled, uh, democratically owned sustainable energy energy structure, energy infrastructure. Sorry, here in the Pioneer Valley and. Um, Ellie Constantinopoulos, I don't know if anybody's familiar with her. She's just a regular person. She's a resident of Greenfield, actually. Mm -hmm. She helped uh, their town put together a very successful, actually, energy efficiency canvassing campaign. Um, and actually, we're scheduled to actually work with her relatively soon. I'm hoping to meet with her next week. She, unfortunately, she has the flu you know, at the moment, so I'm waiting for it to get better. Um, and we're at the very, very beginning stages of uh, putting together a canvassing campaign. And the first place I wanted to target only because I live here in Northampton was Northampton. So if there's any way for Co-op Power and myself to be involved, we would love to participate in this particular process. And um, I would highly recommend getting in touch with, uh, with Ellie. She is just a regular person, very, very passionate about energy efficiency type of work. And she would be, I know she would be very excited to help you in any way that you can. Okay, I actually know Ellie. Yeah, okay. is oh, she Green Greenfield? Greenfield? She's yeah. She connected with Green Greenfield and Nancy yeah, right. and that sort of thing. Can I ask you a yeah. question? Yeah. Sure, you said it was successful. Uh, uh, it's successful in terms of, again, well, I'm relatively new to the process. I, mean, I, just, I just joined, but successful in terms of getting in touch with a good number of, of people around there. I know they did one. She worked with um, some folks up in Sunderland, I believe. And all of the energy audits that we're doing right now, all up in all up in Sunderland, 
Um, our calendar is actually has been relatively booked with our auditors going up and doing the uh, energy assessment audits up there. So in terms of successful, I mean that you know she was successful in terms of getting in touch with a fair number of people and using this process. In this. Using this process, yes. Okay. Yeah, actually, I, I kind of um, uh, she knocked on she or others knocked on every single door in Greenfield. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, uh, and the end result was a at least an audit rate that was at least twice the average uh, for for the state. So double the average audit rate, at least at, at, le at least that, and possibly even the install was up uh, uh, up higher than that. So um, the only way, you, it, the only measure that uh, the utilities would put on this that would be not successful was how much does it cost to pay someone to knock on every single door? Well, you know, so is the cost is the cost benefit good enough? Federal grant, but yeah, maybe that's what it takes. You know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, if you, <laughs> you got to be successful somehow. So so Ellie is a good resource. Yeah. Yep. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No, oh, no. Do, you, do you have a card or contact? You know, I don't have my business cards yet, but I'd be more than happy to. I'll call you tomorrow. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, excellent. Okay, great. Yeah. And, that, and that goes to Mary's point, though, I'm not saying that you before we move on, is that the most powerful is actually being in the room with them. It's, that's the entree. If you can actually have an opportunity to talk with someone and, and, and can demonstrably explain how it works, that, that's better than that, that is the best, but of course, that's the one that always seems so daunting about literally going door to door. It's pretty, mm. you know, anyone who's done that, and I've done that, you, you, it's it's a horrible experience. It should be community <laughs> service for right somebody who's committed a crime, but it's, <laughs> but well, you it's, it's, get away from the concept of they think you're selling something. Mm -hmm. you, it does feel like that, unless, you, and, the, mm -hmm. and that's the fact, is that's true. Anyone who knocks on your door, you expect. They want something to close to giving you something, whereas that's all. Yeah, that's a that's something you have to figure out how you do that. That's the nice thing about the open house or the uh, yeah. right the profile to house.com. It's this you know, huge profile. You're supposed to projects of any of them. It takes down all the barriers. You just you see it. You know, no one's trying to sell you anything. Mm -hmm. The technology explained. And that's why I like the, the power of the internet here. Is that if you create some viral, people are sharing photos of what they're doing or what contractors share projects they've done and it's not there's no agenda from anywhere that's that's right. up front. I mean of course there's someone's logo we've done a project but it's not someone at your door or a uh, uh, you know non profit canvas or whatever. So towards that, uh, to set a time to meet, should we take a stab at it now? Should I like send out a uh, survey to folks who have shown interest and, and just uh, everybody chip it uh, sure. and, then, and then we'll make that the public poll. poll. Yeah, mm -hmm. doodle poll. Yeah, yeah okay. doodle poll would probably be better. Somewhere okay. halfway between now and next meeting. Yes. Um, okay, you can aim for about halfway. So aim for maybe the last week of uh, January uh, okay. to start off with. That would be good. Okay. Um, and because I'm hearing in interest in the general public, um, I will. I'm not sure how easily it's. Um, I will try to get it online, uh, but our energy pages on the city's website are rather buried, I'm afraid. Uh, so, uh, as best I can think I can do is try to put them on the energy pages on the city's website, but just keep your ears open for it. You can sign up for what meetings you're right. you interested get a word in. For it. I mean, that's yeah, how I got the agenda, and, and, and so if it's oh, listed good. as a meeting, I'll find out about it. Okay, so you, so our agenda came out to you. Yeah, you can sign up for alerts yeah. on any. Yes, I'm on good. the alert. Okay. <laughs> I didn't even know I was advertising. And there yes. I was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go to the city's page. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'll get a doodle poll out on that. Um, and then we'll get the city alert for this meeting here. How about that? I didn't even know that was happening. Yep. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so I, uh, the next on the agenda is actually a status update on a lot of um, items. Uh, but I think I actually want to jump to the last one because there might be more uh, items for future consideration. I just want to pass a couple things by, by folks. Um, and maybe we'll dive into the conversation now. Or maybe we'll put it for the agenda. Maybe the Energy Commission will say, now nah, let's not talk about that. 
Um, uh, so so um, I am and Wayne uh, is part of this New England Municipals Sustainability Network. <coughs> so it's the folks who have uh, who have the position of, of, of running the sustainability, energy efficiency, et cetera, operations in their cities. And it's really run differently in many different, in all the different kind of communities. Um, but it's becoming more and more and more a, a major piece of city government. Um, uh, and Northampton, you know, we structure ours the way we kind of handle sustainability. And sustainability to me is much larger than just energy efficiency. It's the recycling program that the DPW runs. It's the planning that, they, uh, that uh, Wayne does, the, uh, you know, traffic patterns and stuff, infill development, um, uh, uh, the tree committee. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really a lot of different things. And the Sustainable Northampton Plan touches on all of those and then assigns those tasks and those, you know, those goals to different departments in Northampton. And so the different departments are all doing this in a way. Does this, do you might, is this, is this, is everybody else kind of recognizing this? Am I reflecting this correctly? Sure. Okay. So um, I know there's, uh, I've been kind of impressed with the way Providence, uh, Rhode Island, and Cambridge, Massachusetts have chosen to do their sustainability. Um, I'm not sure if they had this kind of interdepartmental placement before this, but when they went for it, um, they had one person, and and so as an example, I'm going to use this one person example, who, who uh, sometimes sits in the mayor's office, sometimes it's a separate, but they're not in any one department, but their task is to really coordinate all the departments so that you keep track of all the sustainability stuff. You can, you know, make sure you are helping each other get through, and some different pieces of the process of the sustainability plan are not being dropped off the sides. Um, there's times when I hear other things that are happening in the cities, like, I didn't know that was happening. Uh, you know, it really does kind of touch on sustainability, but I don't necessarily know it. And I think that's probably the case with, you know, the stuff that I'm doing and what David's doing, the other, the others probably have no idea. For instance, we're putting in LED uh, post-top lights. But I didn't realize I was about to put LED post-top lights in Pulaski Park, and Pulaski Park's about to be redeveloped. So <laughs> it was, you know, was kind of like, that's, that's a miss there. Um, so I'm, I'd like to open up and uh, for a discussion. How could Northampton, or does Northampton have to look at this? Maybe we're doing fine the way we are. But should Northampton look at how do we coordinate things uh, and keep track of how our sustainability is going, particularly the way we're about to do, redo the sustainable Northampton plan, working a lot of this more in, whether it's weaving it through or a whole chapter in itself. You know, how do we, how does the city, is there something that we could recommend to the mayor for how it's structured for, um, uh, so there's some more conscious coordination amongst uh, the different efforts that are going on. You know, first thought that comes to me is the Energy Commission has all the department heads on it. Should that be it? And yet we only meet once a month. I'm not quite sure if that's it. You know, I'm not sure if we need a staff person to do it or if it's a meeting. But I, um, I open it up uh, as something that perhaps we could talk about, perhaps we put it on an agenda for a future, um, future meeting. And I'd just like to hear the Commission's feedback um, on this. Uh, you know, is this is this something that we talk about? I'm kind of dropping it in everybody's laps right now without any chance to really think about it in advance. Um, but just what's, what's the feedback? Any, any comments? Well, I would be inclined to defer to the department heads that you've heard. In fact, Wayne's title actually has its planning and sustainability. Mm -hmm. But um, you guys all know the, the successes and failures of the interaction and probably have a, a far better sense than I do. I, I, I mean, I understand. Um, I can try and share. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I, I understand what, what Chris is saying could exist, does it exist, the, the issues of uh, miscommunication or absence of coordination when we could benefit by coordinating better. Is that? Is that something that you guys experience as well? It's, it's a, it's a quasi-successful dance the way we do it now, Bill. Uh, when Chris and I talked about this concept yesterday, I said, well, I said, 
the major departments in the city who deal with this do already sit on the commission. Uh, you know, Wayne and I will reach out to each other if we need to get involved in something because they're sort of ongoing check-ins and uh, you know, as Wayne put notices out with, hey, we're just going to start working on these projects. No, because we're all so busy. Uh, so, you know, Ned and Louie and me and Wayne are sort of the four major departments in the city where sustainability is running through. Right. Uh, I, I have an issue that I to bring up today, new business. I did exactly the kind of issue I think you're talking about. So this is one, one of my four. Okay, at the commission. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think the structure is there. You know, informally we do it as needed uh, on an ongoing basis now. Would the commission give us added capacity? Yes, but I don't know how. I haven't thought enough about it yet. Uh, are there other departments that are involved in sustainability programs and projects that aren't represented here? I don't think so. Uh, I think it's the four that are here, the main ones. So we're, to me, we're part way there, but we could always improve on the model. Maybe one thing would be great as a citizen member to hear how in your daily jobs those the currents are over, you know, how, how you're connecting. So maybe that's like an update once a meeting, like how are the city departments, what are projects that are happening, like how are you connecting or linking sustainability, and then even giving a few minutes to talk about those projects or those issues in the context of sustainability, basically stepping back from your daily business and looking at how does this fit into the context of this commission and, and sustainability as a whole. I don't know if that, it would be interesting for me, I don't know if it would be helpful for our charge or your process in terms of getting, getting some resolution or answering questions or something. But so I, I have a comment that may or may not be applicable to the four department heads, but it's been interesting in our office because we're trying out new management techniques. So I'm, I was recently promoted to deputy executive director, or whatever, so if my boss dies, then I get to go and collect sponsorships. <laughs> But, uh, but we work together very well. So we're trying some new management things. One of the things that we're doing is every morning at 9.45, we ring this bell. People gather in the coffee area, in our main area, and you just do a quick rundown of what you're doing today. This is not something you guys could do. But it was really unique for us because everybody has their own silo. And it, it sort of, you said something, oh, well, I gotta meet with so-and-so about this. Oh, wait a second, you know, I'm gonna also talk to that person and uh, why don't you know? Why don't we collaborate on this, or we could do this together? Or, oh, that reminded me of something important. It was basically it's basically just more communication and and opportunities to do it. The meeting we've got ten people on our staff. It it's absolutely can't take more than fifteen minutes. All you can do is a quick bullet list of what you're doing that day. That's been very effective for us. Another thing we did. This is brand new. Today we had something called Reboot Day. It was recommended by our new communications guy. Four hours, imagine that, in the middle of the day, four hours. No meetings, no phone calls. You're working on all the stuff that's in your office. You're cleaning your office, basically, is what we did today, the very first one. And uh, we all had lunch together, and then we talked about a project that the whole office needs to deal with, which is basically all our files in our shared cloud Dropbox file. Have people you know, name them different things and they're all in the wrong places and so this is something the group has to deal with. But the first part of Reboot Day was you don't have anything on your agenda and you're cleaning up all your stuff and it gave you a chance to read. Uh, I found a file on uh, some, uh, you know, climate action plan that I collected a couple, you know, months ago and I'm like, oh good, okay, I got to start reading that for about 15 minutes because I had total relaxation. But basically it's just getting whoever your manager is, the mayor, maybe, on board with, hey, I need X hours, or I need X time to do communication, and I need to put it in my schedule, and it's going to be valuable. It's something that we've started, and it seems to be valuable. Just looking at things differently. So, Mary's comments got me thinking about two possible avenues for us. One is the ring the bell thing. I don't know if our monthly meetings are frequent enough to do that touch in on, and then this is what Avon was talking about, I think, just uh, our roundtable discussion of what you're doing in your department and how that might interact from a sustainability perspective. Just a chance to make sure, you know, things aren't dropping between the silos. Mm -hmm. uh, 
question is one of frequencies, monthly enough to. It doesn't sound like balls are crashing to the ground. <coughs> no, I, I, I don't Maybe mean to imply. Isn't. I don't mean to imply at all that things are failing. Yeah. I think Northampton has got a, you know, decades-long track records of moving stuff forward. Mm. Um, just that other communities are now doing this, kind of from the ground up, and how they're designing this. This this happened organically in Northampton. Others sat back and designed it, and should we take a look at it? Yeah. You know, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. The other reaction I had was um, that that house cleaning made me think. You know, we have a lot of stuff that has started and then been overtaken by events. A lot of which is in the Sustainable Northampton plan. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if, like a some sort of a bulletin board of all of the initiatives that we would like to keep spinning, just as a place for all of us to check in and, and say, you know, should this one be bubbling to the surface this quarter, year, decade? Rather than, you know, like when you mentioned Climate Action Plan, I'm like, yeah, what happened to that? <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a lot like that, that we started and it, it, it really did get overtaken by events. A lot of what takes us over is grant funding, for good reason. You know, we're, we're following the money, but we're not necessarily following the priorities in the SNP. And with a new one coming out, maybe it's an opportunity to refresh our systems for making sure we, you know, keep rechecking in with each other on priorities against that plan. It might also be worth sort of thinking about what this commission wants to be. I mean, it seems like most, I mean, not the department heads, but the other people sort of got on commission because of energy and because of climate change, um, which are a critical part of sustainability, but certainly not <coughs> by a long shot all the sustainability. We don't have a lot of conversations here about social equity, which is, I mean, a little bit in terms of, you know, where does money go for rehabs, but it's not general our focus here. We don't do a lot about sustainable economic development. Um, and so part of the thing is, it, if we want to have those broader conversations, is that sort of the interest of this committee, and is this the right place, and are we duplicating what other things are doing? So that's sort of part of this for me, is this, is this really the Energy Commission, or Energy and Sustainability and the problem? Chris and I talked about this once, of you know, sustainability, if it's well done, it should be part of everyone's job in the city. Um, you know, it's interesting, I see, if you look at the literature, the word sustainability, on the one hand, keeps going up, you know, you, you see more and more use of it. On the other hand, actually see communities using sustainability yet less and begin to use resiliency more. Sort of as a different kind of message. Mm -hmm. And so I, just trying to figure out where where's this commission position versus the different departments. Because the resiliency is hot right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well and sustainability is, you know, the UN popularized the term and in a lot of the country if the UN is interested in it, you can't use that word. Right. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It's newer in I think the point you raise of economic development is important. I mean, Chris, and you're talking, and um, I think here, you know, what about the um, economic development in the city, especially like in light of you know, two um, businesses closing downtown? Just how does that affect the culture and the feel and quality of life, which I think is an important part of sustainability? Also. I don't know how we integrate that here, but maybe it's a, just interfacing with the economic de uh, development. Person I, I guess right, that would be, uh, yeah, I mean, there is an economic development, so. What's his title now, actually? Yeah, okay, okay, well, coordinator, right? Coordinator, coordinator, right. coordinator, right, out of the mayor's office, so. Like, how does he say, like, zoning changes, how, does it, how will that impact going downtown? I can't understand that one. I think we have Paul and then David. I saw him go left. I think it may be good to talk about that issue. What is this committee, committee's main mission? I mean, right? first uh, heard of it, you know, working on reinstituting this, my focus was specifically around the issue of energy. And that it may, and that's still where it is, but that may not be where other people are, because I didn't, I didn't see other places where that issue was, was given enough time, where there was enough direction on that. I think there, from my perspective, there's enough to be done around that, that this committee could focus on that. We do have another committee EDLU, which is economic development, which is certainly going to look at the kind of issues you're talking about. And certainly that issues overlap between committees, but because of the, my own interest in climate change and, and renewable energy was what 
spurred me to be one of those people to keep pushing to have a, a separate committee like this. Uh, but I think it's a good discussion for this whole group to have. On well, the point of social equity, actually, I just jumped in. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you for catching <laughs> yourself, though, because I missed it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> David, go ahead. No, go ahead. No. Oh. Well, the point of so social equity, I actually think, comes up short when, when you compare it with our concentration on energy. And I think it's an important aspect of sustainability that we have people committed to and devoted to, and that, <coughs> you know, in some level, it's it is culturally part of the warp and weave of what we at least purport to be. And, but it really frequently gets short shrift in the conversations. Uh, economic development certainly pops to the top when you start to con when you're concerned about a little casino. Energy, of course, our successes there are great because that's the one thing we get to really feel that we've kicked some asses with. And, and, and we are a paragon, in fact, for the state and I would say for the country. The social equity part, speaks to something that, that's actually closer to my heart in some respect because the work community frequently brags on our diversity without actually any evident representation of that diversity. And um, everyone with the best intentions without the best successes. And so when we, and I, I think that is a I personally would like to bring that more into the sustainability conversation, that, that when we have these conversations going forward, and if there is kind of a, a sustainability focus or a central touch point, I, want, I personally would lobby for that to move up a few pegs um, so that we're, there were more conscientious about it when we proceed. I mean, right now I find myself making arguments with people when we're <clears throat> when we're trying to develop affordable housing, we're talking about aesthetics, we're talking about energy, we're talking about everything else but the affordability and what that and what that contributes to the, the, the community. So you know, unfortunately the whole basis of the conversation is completely shifted around systems and controls and buildings and things and less about the occupants of those buildings. So I just wanted to go back to Chris's initial point that he raised about this framework. What are other communities doing as far as how they're coordinating multiple departments and agencies that are addressing sustainability <coughs> and everything that it includes, including the social issues? Um, so I guess what I'd like to suggest, Chris, uh, do some outreach and discuss, have some discussion with your, your co-sustainability network members and look at some models that are in play. Um, I'd be curious, you know, if they have energy committees or commissions, how they differ from ours as far as their scope, makeup. Um, and let's put it on as an agenda item for a presentation of some of these different models. Um, so the commission, can, including myself, can understand what are the pluses, what are the minuses, what are the strengths. Um, are there some things that maybe the four departments and others economic development should begin to do outside of the commission and adjacent to the commission in coordination with the commission? I don't know. I, I would be curious to see that uh, and put it on as an agenda, item, Chris. So I can answer that partially. I'm, I'm writing a monograph for um, American Planning Association on Management of Local Planning, and so I, that's part of what I'm doing in that piece. Um, and I teach a planning class at UMass, and one of the things I've been asking my students to do is to look at governments around the country and sort of how they organize for those functions. And I, I will say that there is no winning formula that there are sustainability offices within planning, the sustainability offices as part of the mayor's office, they're independent. Um, and I think the, the, the things that are consistent in the successful cities are they talk to each other, and the structure isn't really what matters. Mm -hmm. That whatever the structures are, that you get really good, all the structures fail sometimes, and all the structures work sometimes, and the communication is more important. You know, one of the challenges, particularly for a committee of volunteers, if you meet once a month, is I just think about things that I've been working on the last week are things like, you know, community gardens for low-income neighborhoods. This is the, you know, what, what you were talking about. And, you know, expanding bike paths, and, you know. And, and so the stuff that we do that fits in that sustainability rubric is really broad. So I'm not sure, I think, if we if we use this committee just to coordinate all those things, that's sort of all what we, what we do is talk about those things. <coughs> 
I think there's a benefit in spending some time, but if we could, but I think us being somewhat specialized is probably more of that. Right. I'll call myself. <laughs> so, um, you know, towards that, just looking again at the energy and state utilities uh, purpose, which was spelled in out in the ordinance, um, it really is energy efficiency, renewable energy, and climate change. And the energy efficiency and renewable energy, that's fairly easily to define and somewhat narrow. As soon as you put climate change in there, then you are talking about transportation networks, recycling, you know, waste management. Resiliency. What's that? Resiliency. Resiliency, right, exactly. So that kind of broadens out. But it does limit it somewhat. In other words, I actually think, on kind of unfortunately, it would not include necessarily no, no, and, and uh, no, and I wasn't necessarily right, that right, should so be one of, right, one of so the charges of this committee, but right, and I'm throwing this yeah. out as an open discussion. So, you know, perhaps if you look at the ordinance, NESC would actually stay somewhat limited if it was to kind of report out from the different department heads. It would be a limited number, you know, and basically, <laughs> is this something that addresses climate change? Would be kind of the big question. But it also points to the mass site plan, which is more is broader. Right, yes, yes, but like, like I said, because the city actually made, d handles that by uh, oh, having things in different d different departments, so it's kind of siloed. So, so today, let me remind you, you all in November talked about this climate adaptation plan that we're talking about. So you all supported us spending $5,000 from the SREC trust, where you call that piece. Yeah, um, and, and I don't have an announcement to make yet that we're getting that piece, but I'm sort of 98% certain that that we're going to get this project. And, and so we pitched it to AIA, this is about, so an outside team coming in for three days. This was the same process we used eight years ago to kick off sustainable at Hampton, to sort of have an outside team come in, challenge us, getting us to think out of the box. We presented to them as this is a joint project of planning, which does a lot of work with climate change, and this committee. Um, and so I think, and that may be an opportunity to think not only about substantive parts about climate change, but about the structure. So, you know, the, the climate change is part of a process that Chris was involved in and Ned was involved with for doing our all hazard mitigation plan. Um, so, climate change cuts across a lot of departments, at least the, the three departments <coughs> here, I guess building two, so the, the four departments here. Um, but that may be a good opportunity to have some of these conversations to think about. So, what's the structure and what works for every moment? Um, because, again, I think, you know, climate change, in particular, particularly when we get into climate adaptation um, is really going to affect all, not only these four departments, but other departments as well. So trying to wrap this up, I could kind of have a takeaway here is, uh, actually, wait, I, I like that idea, that, that it, it kind of could fit in that if we, if we get there. And, and David, your idea of looking at what other communities are doing, um, and this actually the New England, what I call the nickname, the, the NEMS network, New England Municipal I can't remember what it stands for. New England Sustainability Municipal <laughs> Network. Um, anyhow, I believe they have, as a possible agenda item, doing just what David suggested, start sharing with how do we structure ourselves and, and start uh, um, sharing that. So that might be interesting for me to actually go out and get some models and bring it back. And then just maybe we just keep it in mind for when, if we get this opportunity to look at the whole sustainable work happening plan. But I do hope, you know, welcome others to kind of um, uh, think it through, kind of keep it in mind. Uh, maybe I'm kind of going above my pay grade here by, <laughs> by bringing this up. Um, uh, but uh, also uh, think about how the Energy Commission might be useful. I mean, I find myself often coming up with the agenda, well, most all the time coming up with the agenda, and, and maybe there's things that are being missed that don't you know, dead. Maybe you want to bring something out of that actually kind of fits for recycling or something like that to the energy commission before. So I kind of just kind of welcome everybody to sort of think that through. Um, and is it? And should we put this on the agenda for future dates? Maybe wait until we see if we get this grant opportunity. <coughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Um, um, and I do want to bring one more thing up under oh, the topic here. The um, Items for future consideration. Does anybody else have anything items for future consideration? This, the same network. You know, uh, uh, actually, Lou, watch. Go ahead. Um, Columbia Gas is 
has the moratorium on new connections, and it's going to have a big effect on Northampton. And I wonder if anybody can come up with any ideas that we could take to them. And one thing that I thought was that Northampton builds, you know, very efficient housing, and if they hook up to a house that is built in Northampton, they're going to get more bang for the buck than they will in some other communities. And uh, you know, how can we like promote that aspect of it? Because it's really we really are going to start to see um, less efficient houses go up uh, because, for instance, the equipment that you can put into a house that could start on propane and then switch to natural gas is not as efficient as a dedicated particular piece of equipment. I don't think you can find convertible 98% efficient gas units. Then, and what, so what? <coughs> how could we make a case? For do you think they're open to redefining what they're more trying to sell? Um, I think this got. I think there's some latitude. I think it's partly, partly this whole idea that um, they're um, they want the pipeline. So this goes back. Yeah. 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 We'd say you should not have a moratorium on infill development. Have a moratorium on suburban development, mm -hmm. but don't have a moratorium on infill development. Particularly places where we're in Poyo can not. No, no. Where does a gas line if someone's filling the gas right. or if you're in developed areas? Mm -hmm. and those, and, and that's in some ways the argument I make is you know, fine, have a moratorium in places where you're getting this suburban development. Right. When's it going to affect? It, it is. It is. Yeah. It already yeah. 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 So no fuel conversions. No, 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 gas no new connections and no increased volume connections. So you can't replace your electric stove with a gas stove? <coughs> um, well, if the capacity of the service would, would accommodate huh. the gas stove, you could do it. You could Because you could work within the context of it, but there's a place across the street that has a really inefficient oil furnace and they want to convert to gas, but the gas company won't increase the size of the connection to so you know they're plugging away on oil. Can, can I have one reason that it's so clearly about the pipeline is Columbia Gas five years ago was looking for a site in Northampton to pump gas to during the summer when there's a surplus capacity and fill tanks or liquefy or whatever you do and then release it slowly in the winter and they never did that. And there's they never still did that. they never did that. Still opportunities. We we pitched a site at the uh, business park on Route 10, which is right next to the Tennessee Gas Pipeline. Um, so, it, you know, if they were really had capacity issues, I get it, but that's the cheapest way to get capacity is take when the pipes are running or aren't full. And there's, that's true. For, I mean, a lot, of town, a lot of places are general electricity, so that they're not as empty in the summer as they used to be, but there's still surplus capacity. A lot of Do you know why they didn't build it? You know, it's costly, nobody wants it, they blow up like bombs. So there's lots of issues. I mean, they aren't, they're physical. <laughs> um, but, you know, they also pay good property taxes. So, because we had a discussion, this may go back to Mary Ford, it's certainly going back a long time, is were we willing to give up the business park site, given there were no jobs? And the answer at the time was yes, because it's really good taxes. Um, and, and no traffic, so it wasn't a bad thing for us. You know, I'm not pushing the retent site, but it, it meant a lot of things. It was far away from other homes, it got taxes, and it's next to the pipeline. And so I'm just personally frustrated with this solution that there are ways to solve it. So if Louis thinks that they're open to adjust the moratorium in Northampton and we come up with some language or some requirements, no. you can think we, I think we come up with, I think it's the, sort of the, I think the other, the way we do it, the way we approach it is we come up with language and we bring it to the politicians and we bring it to the, to the executives and, you know, and, and start to bring some pressure to bear on it. You know, why could you possibly not agree with our you know, position? And, uh, mm -hmm. Do, can I just ask Darren works in policy around this? Do you, have you heard this before? Do you know if this would have any traction? No. Oh. In two minutes? Yeah, I, I'm not sure, quite frankly. I've been staying out of the whole pipeline issue, but I, I, I know exactly who I could ask on, on that and get back to you on that. It'd be interesting to hear if it's yeah. this work. That this, <coughs> yeah, it's a nice way for us to lead and set an example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with, with, a, with only a few minutes left to go, um, I, I personally think that's really, we should have that on the next agenda item. Um, I'm not sure what steps we can take between now and then. Um, any ideas? 
you know, right, that bring bring ideas. Okay. Is it up to us to like educate homeowners or contractors of what good other options are there? Well, that's happening already. I mean, we're already talking to, I mean, I already started the research with our gas inspector about what sorts of equipment are, is available that could be converted after the fact. Can we come up with a, you know, some kind of an assessment of what, how expensive it is to plunk a, a you know, a, a propane tank in your backyard and then take it out later and, uh, you know, all those variables. But, uh, gas is a lot more efficient than oil than, and than, more than right. propane. Yep. Unfortunate. Well, propane's pretty good. It's just, it's, it's just very expensive. Okay. And it's expensive because it takes, it, it's hard to make. It doesn't, it, you know, it's expensive in that fashion. But the, at some point, I see possibly a letter being generated by this committee uh, making our case. Well, you know, claiming, and I haven't figured out how to do it yet, but claim, you know, we, our, we're a stretch code community, but our, the, the how, you know, the average PERS rating of a house in this town is way better than the stretch code right. requirements. You know, it's, it, it, the average rating is, is somewhere around whatever the worst case scenario they're talking about for the new stretch code. And that, and it would seem to me that the HERS rating would be something they're more, attuned to for consumption relative to consumption. And it but it's probably fuel conversions that they're most concerned about, existing houses switching over to natural gas, aside from like a village hill development or something. Right, well, I mean, they're, the moratorium is the moratorium. Yeah. Period, you know, it's one tool. And, they've, and, and the contract, I'm hearing from some developers, like, um, you know, both, both on paper and then just the calls. What can I say? <laughs> Not much, you know. Yeah. Exactly, just things still things highly efficient. I was just sitting around and wondering. And, 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 you know, how can we problem. work with it? You know, they, you hate the idea of taking a step backwards just because, you know, you have to shift to oil or... I mean, you can make the herd rating work with those other fuels. You just... And, you know, going back to the 70s, all-electric houses, Awfully unappealing at this point. Even not right. even with the solar. I would argue differently. I mean, I think maybe you should expand your research into electric. Because mass but well, it's certainly oh, we're certainly going. Right. I mean, we're not leaving anything out of the equation, but it's looking awfully expensive, and you're also committed to that. Right. Um, and I don't know how that, and I don't understand enough about how that might end up working. Okay, for the sake of time, I guess, put that off the next agenda? I don't know. I can't give myself oh, yeah. I'm happy with ideas. Right. Oh, one minute Can you hand this out at your office? Um, okay. Well, I can hand out of one minute left. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, uh, so we've got one Robert. minute left. Oh, one minute. One other thing oh, is New England Municipal Sustainability Network Session Proposal. I think it didn't make it back to you. Nobody got back to you. And I wanted to bring up a look on the website. We originally told them that the proposal was accepted, and I looked on the website. Okay, it's not there. And it focuses on energy efficiency. Oh, that's a good one. Thank you. 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 Thank you.